Well, praise the Lord. <clears throat> I was, um, I've got a scripture that I want to share, and I, I saw the scripture years ago, and it really jumped out at me. And uh, it's in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, but before I uh, get into that, I want to kind of give a background. And, and after seeing that prophecy, I understand now why the, the, why the, the background was so important. As I, as I thought about it, meditated on it, and prayed over it. Uh, <clears throat> the book of Deuteronomy um, was written to the children and grandchildren of the adults who came out of Egypt. So Moses gave the, the, the law, the Mosaic law, to the adults in the book of Leviticus 40 years before he gave the law to the children and the grandchildren in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, now the, the adults died in, in the wilderness because of unbelief. They, they, buy, they died in the wilderness because of sin. Uh, and keep in mind that these adults who, who died in the wilderness, they saw a lot of miracles. They saw, I mean, they, they saw water coming out of a rock in the middle of a dry desert. There was some of the estimates I saw were like a million and a half to, to three million people left Egypt to, to go into the promised land. And, and out, of that, out of that many people, only two adults made it into the promised land. You now that'd be Joshua and, and Caleb. And, and I say that, I, and I, I, I want to get into Hebrews. I'm just itching to, to get into Hebrews because uh, uh, the first four chapters of Hebrews really expands on this. But you've got to have the, the Holy Spirit to be your teacher. And uh, maybe I'll touch on that a little bit later on. Uh, I've got so much I want to give on that. But, but it's the whole idea that uh, only two people made it into the promised land. And, and this, uh, uh, this prophecy that was getting, wow, I just... I was just blown away by that. And I never, I never tied in with the fact that the, those who died in the wilderness were the lukewarm. The, the, they were the lukewarm church that, that died in that wilderness. And uh, it, never, it, never, um, it never crossed my mind. And I just praise the Lord that, that the Lord doesn't give all of you. And I thank the Lord for for Debbie and Sarah for the songs. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to the worship music. And I'm wondering, wow, God is good. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that, that Debbie had no idea, just like I had no idea on, on this video. Uh, you know, God just uses so many different people just, just, to, just to accomplish his, his purposes. Um, well, anyway, so I, uh, I tie the book of Deuteronomy in with um, in with um, the Sermon on the Mount, Deuteronomy was was given on a mountain, and it was the last sermon that uh, that Moses would give, and he's to go up after after he's finished. I think it's about thirty one chapters in in the book of Deuteronomy, I, I believe, and so so he gives this this book. And then he goes up on this mountain. He knows it before, ahead of time, that he's going to die on this mountain. He goes up there and he looks across the River Jordan at the Promised Land. But because of disobedience, he's not allowed to go into the Promised Land. And so, so, so here's Moses, a man that, that God talked face to face. And he wasn't allowed to go into the Promised Land. Uh, the children of Israel, after seeing all these miracles weren't allowed to go into the promised land. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Pentecostal, charismatic, whatever you want to call it. But uh, miracles are great. They're, they're wonderful. But obedience is so much better. You know, uh, living the word, doing the word, being, being a doer of the word is so much better. And, and, and to get into the promised land... And uh, that's why I, I want to make a homework assignment to go read the first four chapters of Hebrews because I don't think I'm going to get there. But um, 
to get in the promised land is is you just have to do what the word says you have to become a doer of the word don't 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 put all your faith and trust in miracles don't put all your faith and trust in, 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 in these things that you can see because you can see the miracles you can live through the miracles and still die in the wilderness you know you can be a lukewarm Christian in a great church and not get there uh, I titled uh, this uh, heaven on earth because uh, the first verse that I that, that caught my attention was Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11 verse 2 and I think I, I really probably need to read it but it says that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven on earth and and it struck me well when was that when 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 was heaven on earth because we're talking real early uh, we're talking before Israel even got into the promised land and there had been uh, there had already been days of heaven on earth and of course the first thing that, that came to my mind oh well that was the Garden of Eden you know that that was heaven on earth that, that was the ultimate heaven on earth that's where God was walking in the garden with, with Adam and Eve and talked with them walked with them explained things to them gave them understanding and just just enjoyed that relationship that one-on-one -on -one relationship with Adam and Eve in the garden and th that's the essence of heaven on earth is your relationship with God and and sometimes being a lukewarm Christian in, in a church can can ruin that you can you, you can you can be around miracles and and not have a relationship with your Heavenly Father and uh, the the other lesson of uh, and I, I guess I won't give you the scriptures there in Genesis I think we've all read about that how God had put them in the Garden of Eden it's in chapter 2 of Genesis and uh, and uh, one of the other things we we learned about uh, the Garden of Eden is that they were both naked Adam and Eve were both naked and they were not ashamed it wasn't until sin and disobedience came along that they that they needed to be clothed, and they tried to provide their own clothing by um, putting together leaves. But God had a better plan, and and He sacrificed an animal and covered them with animal skins. But but the one thing that you need to learn is that um, the knowledge of good and evil. I got to stick up with Eve because she didn't know anything about evil. She, she she was naive about being deceived by a serpent. You know, and it's but once you know good and evil, you can't go back. See, they they were Adam and Eve were forced out of the garden and and they couldn't go back. You couldn't go back to the, the garden of Eve of Eden because of sin. And once you know evil, you can't go back. And that's why it's so important, and there's other scriptures I want to get into about not putting a wicked thing in your eyes. I think that's in Psalms. It talks about Psalms 101, I believe. It says, I will not put anything wicked in front of my eyes. Because once you put that in front of your eyes, you can't go back. It's there. You know, just like Adam and Eve, they couldn't get back in the garden. Well, they couldn't unsee what they'd seen. They couldn't uneat what they had eaten and and it's so important to experience uh, heaven on earth that you don't put that stuff in front of you to begin with and when you look at families that are blessed and and you realize well they don't know evil they're they're born to parents who who did no evil they're born uh, their their siblings did no evil their children don't need no evil their grandchildren are growing up not knowing evil and, and there's a blessing, there's a generational blessing that goes in that family. And so when, when uh, uh, Moses was talking to the children of Israel about uh, the promised land, he said, if you obey, if you obey these laws, and it wasn't so much that, it was that Moses was laying down the law as much as he was pleading with them to, to advising them to obey this law, so that you can uh, enjoy heaven on earth in the promised land. And when we get this attitude that uh, we bristle when someone lays down the law, 
saying, well, you can't do that. Well, gosh, I'm going to do that even more because you said I can't do that. And uh, we, we've got it all wrong. We, we need to look at the law as, as a way to enjoy heaven on earth in the promised land. Uh, and I'm trying to go through this real quick because um, i got so much uh, that I want to share. But uh, there's uh, another thing that we learn in, in uh, the Garden of Eden is just how simple it is. Heaven on earth is really, really simple. Don't sin. That's it. <laughs> Don't sin. But that's the bad news. The good news is that uh, God has provided uh, a sacrifice for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised with our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The good, good news is that, that our Heavenly Father loved us so much that he sent his only begotten Son in the world to die for us on a cross. That's the good news. Yes, we can't unsee the things that we've seen but God has promised that he's going to take our sins and he's going to throw them in the sea of forgetfulness. And God will, will forget about our sins. And we're a new creation. So we have all these wonderful promises in Scripture uh, about, about uh, the sin nature and, and how to deal with the sin nature. Uh, the next thing on the heaven on earth, as I wonder, well, what else? Is there more? And I was taken to Enoch. And, and the thing that I like about Enoch um, is, is how short that is. It's in Genesis uh, chapter 5, verse 23. And I want to look at that mainly because I wanted to show you how, how simple it is, how short it is. There's only about two verses. take my glasses off so I can see. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah three hundred years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty-five years. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. And it's the simplicity of that. You got to go to college and get a four-year degree to make that complex. <laughs> you really do, uh, but but it takes the Holy Spirit just to teach you how easy it is to have heaven on earth. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, just like Adam and Eve walked with God. That's that's the secret to, to heaven on earth, is is walking with God. It's that time that you spend with God when you're alone whether it's in bed, whether it's in your prayer closet, whether it's in your car, you need some place alone with God. You need to walk with God. God needs to, God needs to, to uh, show you the way to go. And there's a verse of scripture, and I'll have to quote it. Uh, Thy word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet, and a, and a light to the, my path. Your, your steps, God shows you. By, by, when you hide the word of God in your heart, the Holy Spirit will bring that word, and it'll show you what the next step has got to be. You know, you, you see a light long ahead and where you should go, the general direction you should go, but that Holy Spirit will take the word and show you where that next step is. And it's, so, so when, you, when you do that, then you experience heaven on earth. Um, but it really is simple. And, and and I don't want to overstate it, the fact, but I want to take you to, to Second Corinthians or Second yeah Second Corinthians eleven two. And uh, to show you the simplicity of that, and you've probably got it up on the screen faster than I'm going to be able to turn to it. I hope. Yep, looks like that's the wrong one. 11-2. 
he was talking about the simplicity of Christ. And I evidently wrote it down. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealous jealousy, for I exposed you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin of Christ. But I, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through a subtlety, so your mind should be com corrupted from the simplicity that is, that is in Christ. See, heaven on earth really is simple. And like I said, it takes a four-year degree to make it complex. And uh, um, then I want to take you over to Matthew 18, 3 to 4 to, to show you just how simple it is. And um, in Matthew 4, or 18, verse 3 to 4, it says, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that's what I really want you to understand. Heaven on earth is, first of all, humility. You know, you know, becoming like a little child. You know, to be born again is to become a newborn baby, and then newborn babies can be kind of kind of messy. But uh, but a little child, and when, when I think of a little child, I'm thinking about a 12 to 18 month old child. They're just they're just at that wonderful time, and the thing about a little child at that age is everybody loves that. The, the hardest hearted person loves to be around a a, a little child like that. And then you when you you kind of wonder about well why is that? How is that? And the thing with a little child is they don't know evil. The child has no idea about politics. The child has no idea about sin and wickedness. According to, the, you know, that little child looks at everybody as they're just a wonderful friend. And, the, and then that child just loves their dad. You know, and, and a dad loves the child. You know, and that, that little child, my dirtiest diver, but dad just hands it over to mother. You know, and then that then that mess is all gone, and and you know that relationship between that, that child and that father is just wonderful, and, and that child won't sin against the father. The child always wants to please the father, and and according in the father's eyes, that child can't do anything wrong. You know, and and and, and everybody knows you don't interfere with that relationship between a, a, that newborn child and and his father you know you just don't interfere you know the things that the father think are great maybe you think well maybe not but you just don't interfere that that's a relationship there's a special relationship between that child and the secret to heaven on earth is humbling ourselves and becoming like that child you know to where you don't know evil you know that 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 12-year-old child knows nothing about pornography. That child, that child, that 12-month-old that child knows nothing about politics, knows nothing about work. You know, that, that child just, just knows that everything's provided for him. And all that child knows is good. That child hasn't been introduced to evil yet. And there, I, I wish there was just some way we could just all go back and unsee the things that we've seen, undo the things that we've done. And but the, the secret is to humble ourselves and become like a child. And the promise is that is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, is that child. And you can always know, I don't know if you're like me, but when someone comes to me with their, with their religion and think, well, you're going to go to hell if you don't join my church. You know, these are the doctrines you've got to believe in if you're going to go to, if you're going to end up in heaven. Because that, and, they're, and that person talking to you, and there's been several over the years I've ran into, yeah, they're pretty sure, pretty sure I'm going to hell, you know, because, because I'm not part of their religion. You know, and there's something that rises up within you that just bristles at that notion. But, uh, but I want to assure you that there's, it doesn't matter. You could be a Catholic and God loves you. You could... You know, even if you're a Jehovah's Witness, God loves you. You know, I, I don't care what flavor of religion that you've embraced. God loves you. 
You know, if you humble yourself as a child, you know, you're going to enter into that kingdom of heaven. And uh, well, maybe I will go to Hebrews. I didn't think I was going to make it. The thing with 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 Hebrews, those first four chapters. There's a subtlety that's that's hidden from the lukewarm. It's hidden from those that are wise. And and the Apostle Paul, and it took me a long time to see this. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul, and I I, I I I ascribe the Apostle Paul as the one who wrote Hebrews. In reality, we don't know who wrote it, who the offer was. But, um, in verse 7, chapter 3, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of the temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works of forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways, and I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. See, here was a generation of adults that saw all these miracles. They walked through the, the, the Red Sea, with the water piled up, they walked on dry, dry land. They saw the Pharaoh's armies being drowned in that sea. They saw the rock with water coming out of it. They, they ate of the manna that came down for 40 years. 40 years this, this manna came down and this millions of people ate manna. Millions of people drank water from this rock. And I didn't know until not too long ago that, that this rock literally followed them around in this desert. In 40 years they drank water out of that out of that rock. Yet they died because of unbelief. They died in that desert because of unbelief. And and so many in churches and, and boy, I'm guilty of this. And I'm sure we all have of being lukewarm in a church and just sitting there hearing the word, seeing miracles and being lukewarm. And uh, I didn't know until I saw this prophecy that uh, that uh, that this represents the lukewarm in this church, who who died in the in the in the desert, and not going to go into the promised land, and and so I, I want us all to just to kind of read this as four chapters, because when you when you have that context of the lukewarm, uh, then those first four chapters will will really stand out. For you. And then verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And the deceitfulness of sin, there's a, a teaching going around that, uh, and, and, and thankfully, I've been put off by teachers. I just don't really follow teachers. And uh, there, there's a teacher that I just recently started to follow. Um, but I've been put off. I, I've been put off by teachers. I've been put off by, by pastors. I've been put off by religion in general. And, and looking back, and I realized that there's a reason why I was put off. And this, this prophecy we saw this morning kind of really explained, man, I, that, that, man, that just hit nerves in me, <laughs> that prophecy. Wow, God was protecting me all these years, protecting me from, from that lukewarmness, protecting me from the sin. The, the sin, there's a teaching going around. I had no idea that anybody even taught this. It's called hyper grace. And I've been a big advocate of grace but there's there's people that have taken grace to the extreme of making it 
making it a license to sin. And there's teachings out there that, uh, well, it's okay to sin. And, and we've had a, a recent example, some man that I, that I never followed, who continued to sin, committed, continued to commit adultery, and yet there was many miracles in his ministry. And, and there was some teachers that finally had to take him and, 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 and try, to, try to reason with him, and he wouldn't accept it, wouldn't accept the, the, the counsel of those, but he continued in his adultery, and he continued to work miracles, and people continued to follow him and believe him, and, and now all these people are, are hurt, they're wounded, because they, they honestly believed that you could sin, they honestly believed that there's a license to sin, and, and it's called grace. And it's such, it's such a perversion of what the Apostle Paul taught. And I'm a big believer in grace. Uh, read the book of Galatians if, if you want to learn grace. But um, and we got to be careful to, to not harden our hearts as in the day of provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke how be not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, who carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest, but to, to them that believed not? And we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us to us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. And that little, that little phrase, seem to have come short of, that's the subtlety that the Apostle Paul teaches. And it's almost like the Apostle Paul struggles. The Apostle Paul knows it, but he's struggling to get us to see it. And, and, and it's a subtlety that we seem to come short of it. And I'm reminded of all the promises in the New Testament that uh, that we seem to fall short of. You know, all things are possible to them that believe. But yet, we seem to come short of it. And uh, I mean, there's so many promises in the New Testament, so many promises in the Old Testament, and it just seems like each one of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And we've sinned, and, and, and these promises haven't been fulfilled in our lives. And it's, and it's, I've struggled like Heath has with why isn't there victory? What, what happens in the victory? Man, we, we've been to these prayer meetings. We've prayed for people. We've seen them uh, be healed, and, and then we lose the healing. What happened? What happened? It's almost like you want to just stand back and, and not even believe anymore. And it was this, this prophecy that, uh, that really brought it home to me. Oh, that was a lukewarm church. You know, it was that lukewarm church that, that died in the wilderness. There's only two that, that made us in the promised land. There's only two that, that lived on this earth and went to heaven without, without seeing death. You know, Enoch and uh, the prophet Elijah. Now, the prophet Elijah was in, in a pretty wicked time at that time with uh, Ahab and Jezebel. And the, the prophets of Baal, but yet Elijah went up in the whirlwind and, and didn't have to die. There's only going to be two witnesses uh, in the book of Revelation. And I don't know what it is about two. Uh, he mentioned in this prophecy about uh, the two shepherds, and I, I guess I don't understand all that. Maybe someone can enlighten me on that. But there's something about two. It's, it's like there's an exclusive club that, that the rest of us can't enter into. And I guess my message here tonight, or today, this morning, is that it's really simple. Don't sin. <laughs> it's really, there, there's a simplicity in Christ. There, there, there's a simplicity in, in heaven on earth. And that's the relationship with your father. It's not that meeting that we go to. It's not that, that evangelist that, that, that we go out of our way to see. It's that prayer closet. 
It's that a time alone with your father. It's that, it's that relationship that we develop with our Heavenly Father. It's humbling ourselves and becoming like a child uh, to our Heavenly Father. That's, that's a secret to heaven down on earth. And, um, and I guess with that, I'm not going to elaborate on that anymore because I could, I could, I could be like the religious that, that's take that, that simplicity. And I don't have a four-year degree. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't go down that road. <laughs> so, anyway, I'll just I'll just uh, close that out, and I'll leave it up to Keith.